switch shoes. Okay, um, aren't you thankful to be in God's house and to gather together? And that's something we should never take lightly. Can you guys see me past my computer? Okay. <laughs> oh, I need to cut like a foot off of, I tell Nate that. Okay. But that's something we should not take lightly or for granted is that we get to gather together. What an honor and a privilege. And there's so many people all over the world who don't have that privilege. And it's something, you know, just like what um, Kyle and Jake were saying, sometimes we can take things for granted. Like that little boy who said it's new. How often we can take things for granted. And we're going to talk a little bit this morning about honor. And this is something that actually Pastor Nate and I have been talking with our staff on for a couple weeks here. And just really the Lord highlighting this again to us. And how many of you know... Just because we've been taught in an area one time, we, sometimes we can let things slip. And so the Holy Spirit is so good to come and to remind us again of what we're needing at the time, and there's always a purpose behind it. He's never coming to us to bash us over the head or to say, you're messing up or you're doing wrong or whatever. He always comes in a loving way, but he will come in a corrective way, but that's a good thing because we're needing it because of what he's wanting to get to us and because of what he's wanting to do through us, right? And so it's our job when he's coming to us with specific words or specific things to take those with a yes heart, to take those with a receptive heart. And how many of you know it can be easy sometimes to hear but not to do? It can be easy sometimes to say, yeah, Lord, I, okay, I see that. And then that's about as far as we take it. (laughs) But how many of you know the word tells us not to just be a hearer, but to be a doer? So there's grace to hear, but there's also a grace to do. And so anything he's asking us to do, there is always grace. There's always an accompaniment with it to do it. So it really all falls back on him. We, we go to him for the direction, and then we go to him for the grace to do what he's asked us to do in that direction, right? Okay, so, um, okay, I'm just going to get this out there. My armpits are sweating. I've done this before, but it just bothers me. So if you see wet pits, <laughs> they are sweating. Okay. <laughs> I'm like a person, like, I know people will notice, and it could be distracting, so we'll just get that out there. My armpits are sweating, and my shirt is wet. Okay. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. Actually, I came, and I was like, why did I wear a tan shirt today preaching on stage? Because I always know my armpits are going to sweat, but life is real. Okay. (laughs) Let's pray. How about we go there? (laughs) And then we will get into it. So, Father, we worship you. We thank you this morning so much for your word. We thank you for the person to the right and to the left of us. We choose to honor you. And as we come before your word, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're there to minister to us. You're there to minister life. You're there to minister grace. You're there to shine the light on the word of God. We thank you that we have eyes that see and ears that hear. Just say that this morning. I have eyes that see and ears that hear what the Spirit is saying. And thank you, Lord, that today we will not just be hearers only, but we will be doers of your word. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, the title of today's message, I have it in all capital letters, and it's Stop the Dishonor. Now, I want to preface this by, this is something I heard the Lord say to me. Stop the dishonor. So what I'm sharing with you today is something the Lord's had me on probably the past week. Actually, even a little bit longer than that. Pastor Nate and I have been talking about that, but just honor. And how many of you know society today is so full of dishonor? You see it everywhere. Everywhere. Everywhere you look, you see dishonor. This is opposite of the culture of the kingdom. The culture of the kingdom is full of honor. 
Now, I'm not up here to say that because I'm preaching it, I'm living this 24-7. And I would venture to say, neither are you. But what do we know? By his grace, every day, we can live with more honor for God and for others. Right? What does it take? It takes when, when we get that nudge that says, hey, that wasn't right, or hey, how you acted, or hey, what you said, that we have enough in us, enough humility in us to say, you know what, that was wrong. I was wrong. When was the last time you said you were wrong? Not just in your mind, but like verbally out loud. In your mind, it can be really easy to go, oh, that wasn't right. And then we just push it off to the side. But how many of you know it takes a little more humility in front of your coworkers, in front of your spouse, in front of your children, in front of your friends, whoever it might be, to say, hey, you know what? I was wrong. That wasn't okay. How I acted, that was not okay. And sometimes we can get into a habit of just mentally saying that wasn't okay instead of verbally And when was the last time we talked to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm sorry, I repent, that was not okay. Not just in my mind, but out of my mouth. Lord, I repent. I'm sorry for that. That attitude, that level of dishonor was not okay, and I repent for that. You know what it says? When we humble ourselves before him, he exalts us. When we humble ourselves before him, there's actually more grace available to us. Part of humbling is repenting. Repenting is coming underneath him and saying, that wasn't okay, I'm sorry. And when we do that, we open ourselves up to receive his grace. We open ourselves up to receive his wisdom. How many of you want more grace and more wisdom? I know I do. So what I'm preaching today is something the Lord has just so been highlighting. And we're going to start out today, um, there's actually two phrases. The first one was stop the dishonor. And then the other one I shared at team night. How many of you are at team night? It's awesome. So, so, so good. But we talked about an overhaul. And this was a word that the Lord actually had me, woke me up in the middle of the night about a week ago. And I just kept hearing over and over several times, overhaul, overhaul. And I was like, okay, Lord, what does that mean? And you know, when the Lord speaks to you on something, it's not just usually a word and you go, okay, overhaul. Okay, that's cool. But if I'm really honoring what he's saying, then I'm going to go dig deeper and say, Lord, what are you saying about that word? I looked up the definition. I'm going to read it here. Overhaul means to take apart in order to examine it and repair it if necessary. Necessary repairs on to restore to serviceable condition to investigate or examine thoroughly, or repair or revision. So when God's coming to us with a word of overhaul, and I believe it wasn't just for me, I believe it's for we, like the body. When he's coming to say, hey, it's overhaul. There needs to be an overhaul. I can look at it and go, overhaul? What are you saying? What I'm doing is wrong? What are you saying? Da, 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 da. I can come and be defensive Or I can come and say, Lord, you're saying overhaul, then show me what areas in my life I need to overhaul. And oftentimes we view that word overhaul as a bad word. Overhaul, in this sense here, to take apart in order to examine and repair it, to get it back to serviceable condition. How many of you know we're in service to the Lord? We're to be doing his service. So if if he's wanting to do an overhaul, then there's stuff in my service to others, in my service to the Lord, that has to be adjusted to make that service better. That's, That's what he's trying to do. How many of you know, if you have a business or say you have a restaurant or a coffee shop or or some something, it would be silly for me to go, oh, we're just doing the same thing we did 15 years ago. It works great. If we were operating the same way today as we were 15 years ago, we would be way behind. As a business, as a person, as anything, we'd be behind. Well, what would that mean? My services would be lacking. So what I'm to be doing for God, what I'm to be doing for others, if I don't frequently have overhauls, 
in my life have areas where the Lord's saying, hey, tweak this, hey, adjust this, hey, do this, then you know what? My serviceable condition to others, my serviceable condition to him is going to be severely lacking. I want my service to others, I want my service to him to be honoring. I want it to be top notch. I want it to be top quality. So what does that mean? That means I have to then go before the Lord when he's showing me these things and I have to say, thank you, Lord, you show me and that you don't just show me, but you give me the grace to apply it and to do it. So we're gonna look at that today. So say this, God is wanting to do an overhaul in me. Now say it again with a smile. God is wanting to do an overhaul in me. See how much better that sounded? I think God liked it a little better too. Okay. So we always have a choice, don't we? We always have a choice. So culture is a big deal. Do you know culture? You walked in today and you sensed culture. You walk into your workplace and you may say, my workplace has a different culture than maybe my home or maybe here at church. Or maybe that family's culture is different than my family's culture. Or maybe you grew up in a culture of your family and you said, when I have a family, I'm not going to have that culture because I want this culture. So in order to have the right culture, we, this is what we shared at team night, we have to share the same values. If you, Jenna wants a culture and Mona wants a culture and Joni wants a culture and everyone in this room wants a culture and we all bring our own idea of a culture, how many of you know it's gonna be a chaotic mess and very full of strife and division? So when God calls you to a local house, when he calls you to a local body, he sets you in that body. And you've done what? You've chosen to say, yep, beyond church, and maybe you haven't, but we pray that God helps you find the right local church that he's called you to. But if he's called you here, then this is where you say, this is my house. I value what we value. Because how many of you know if the local house, if the local church is doing it right, what we value isn't just going to be what Pastor Nate and Evan just pull out of air to value. What do we value? We value what? What the Word of God says. So the values that we live our lives by shouldn't just be lived inside this house. And this is what we shared with our B team. It's great to have core values, and we did an overhaul of them. We adjusted some of them. We added a few new ones because we believe we're in a new season and a new time and God's wanting to adjust and do stuff. So what do we do? We go with what he's saying. But if I'm coming into these doors and saying, okay, these core values and when I'm in church, I gotta be this way and do this and say this, but then I'm walking out of these doors and live in my own values, live in my own culture, based on how I feel and what I want, then I need to look and go, Lord, am I holding to the standard of your word, not just in the house, but am I holding to the standard of your word outside of the house? What does Pastor Nate say all the time? There shouldn't be a church you and a out there you. What should it be? People should know you, how you are in the house and how you are out of the house, right? So culture is huge. So in the world's culture, we know it's full of dishonor. God's people and house should be known as a place of honor. So what does that mean? When you walk in here, it should carry the culture of honor. Guess what? Pastor Nate and I can't just carry the culture of honor here. We can lead it and we can spearhead it, but guess who it takes? Take your hand and then do this. That means when I walk in here, I have a choice of, am I going to honor God today? Am I going to honor people today? I have the choice to set the culture for what, what God wants, right? It's not just up to the person to the left or to the right of me. And this message today isn't for you 
or for me in my mind to be going, yeah, that person really needs to work on that. Or my spouse, if my spouse would just be this way, then I could just be this way. Uh Uh-uh. Today's message is for me. Say that. Today's message is for me. And if the enemy tries to come in to bring in other people, you need to push him out. And you need to say, I'm not controlling other people. I'm not listening for other people. I'm listening for me today. Where is Evan at in honor? Where is Evan at in respect? It's for me. I have a choice. So, in this house, we talked about this at our team night. I get to honor. Anytime I walk in and I say, well, I have to honor so-and-so today. I got to go to church today because I have to honor God and I have to check that box. And, you know, everyone's looking at me, so I got to. We can't have the I have to. We have the what? I get to. I get to serve. I get to go to church. I get to give and to sow and to be generous. We got to change our mindset. I get to honor I get to bless someone today. Honor says I get to. Dishonor says I have to. Honor says I get to. Dishonor says I have to. Anytime we move over into the realm of I have to, we're in dishonor. When I come in with the mindset of I get to honor God, I get to obey his word. I get to read it today, not I have to and oh my gosh. No, thank you, Lord. I get to read your word today. I get to receive wisdom and revelation from you today. I get to set aside time, not I have to or I don't have time. I get to set aside time to spend with you. Your honor for people reveals your honor for God. So a big part of showing honor and respect is in what you don't say and in what you don't do. Okay, I'm going to tell on myself. So um, I'm very competitive. We've been over this before. And um, recently was, um, okay, I want to find this and see if I can. I showed it to a couple of my, our staff. But um, I said, I think I found myself, so I'm tattling on myself. I saw this post, and it says, It is possible to be hyper-competitive, which researchers define as having a neurotic need to win at all costs. And it says, do you know someone who is hyper-competitive? And I'm like, myself. But I'm going to tell on myself, because of my competitiveness, I was at a football game. This is where Jesus has to help me, is in sports. You know how Pastor Nate says you can walk in the fruit of the Spirit when you're by yourself? I can walk in the fruit of the Spirit except at games. (laughs) No, I'm not confessing that. It's not. I I really, honestly, like, I really honestly, before every game, but when I'm walking in, I'm like, I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going to honor. I'm going to bless. But how many of you know we all have areas For you, it may not be competition, it may not be sports, but how many of you know in our lives, we all have areas where dishonor wants to come out? And in some areas, it's a lot more prevalent than other areas. (laughs) For me, it is at sports. And um, anyways, we were at a game this past week, and because of my competitiveness and frustration, because we're in seventh grade football, and... Afterwards, I found out they treat it more like a glorified peewee game is what the word was. And I'm like, I've been in glorified peewee games from first grade all the way to sixth grade. But once my son puts on an Alma Airedale jersey, it's on. (laughs) In my definition. (laughs) Like, we've been through the peewee stuff. When he puts on the jersey, it's on. Like, I want him coached. I want him playing. I want him winning. I want him, okay, that's me told you I'm working on this. My heart is like doing this. Okay. So if I would have known that before the game, (laughs) that this is how, like now I feel like going into the seventh grade games, I'll be a little more mild, but not knowing, not knowing that. 
And over and over and over, the ref's not calling delay of game. At a very pivotal point in the game when we could win and flags not being thrown. Anyways, it was just compiling and I was just holding it in. And I tell people, I bring like, you can ask the Harlesses and stuff, I bring a basket of snacks and food and celery and cucumbers just to stuff my mouth because it helps me not talk. And if I'm eating, and I even told Lisa, she's like, you're almost through your bag of cucumbers. And I said, well, I got to ration it because Matthew's game's after this. And <laughs> hence why I bring a whole basket of snacks. So if you need a snack, just come see me at the game. But um, so I was, I was doing really well and holding it in. And then my hyper-competitive self finally hit a boiling point. How many of you have ever been there before? could be in relationships, could be in areas. And it's like, I've done good, I've done good, and now it's coming out. And usually when it comes out because you've compressed and compressed and compressed and compressed, it's not coming out like, oh, stink. It's like, <laughs> ah! So my hyper-competitive self around a whole stand full of people waited till the whole stands who were yelling sat down and was quiet, and then my hyper-competitive self stood up, making sure the refs could hear me, and you can ask Ty Watson, he was sitting behind us, I think after that he like moved up two rows, I was like, I am, yes, Pastor Evan just lost it, um, so I waited, and Mona, Mona was, got my back, okay, so, uh, so everyone sat down, I stood proceeded to stand up and proceeded to scream. And when I say scream, I sc screamed at the ref. And, you know, everyone's like doing this. And I sat down and I was like, oh, that felt good. <laughs> Later, I found out one of the refs knows Jake. And he texted me and asked about if uh, he was refing. <laughs> Jake sent the text to the group thread and said, did you happen to hear anybody in the stands when you were refing? And he said, oh, you mean the center section about halfway down on the Alma side? I was like, yeah, that's right where we were sitting. And you would think that hearing that, that the ref knew would make me be like, oh my gosh, he heard me. I was like, I feel very accomplished. I, he heard me. He heard me. I am just divulging a lot, but I was not repenting at that moment. At that moment, my flesh was like, yes, he heard me. Everyone else heard me. But you know what? <laughs> After I got off my high of screaming and yelling, my spirit was really like, oh, later. Why? I was not honoring. I was not honoring. So I'm tattling on myself. But how many of you know, it's still good to win. We want to win. And this is what my husband was telling me. And I was not at a place to hear it, but it was like the next day. Still, my flesh was like on a high. And he was like, Evan, I, I think like competitiveness is good, but sometimes you go like it's going a little far. And I'm like, no, it is not because we are supposed to win. And God created us to win. And it really bothers me when... People don't want to win. But you know what? It's true. Like the moment that my competitiveness or my wanting to win dishonors somebody else, it's gone too far. God did create us to win. God did create us to, I mean, he's the greatest champion of all time. But he did it with honor. Not like me. Screaming and yelling. <sighs> okay. So guess what I had to do? I had to repent. That lovely word, repent. I had brought myself to a place and said, you know what? That was absolutely not okay. And you know, then what does the enemy like to come and do? Not The Holy Spirit comes to convict, but what does the enemy like to come and do? He likes to condemn. So then he likes to get you over into the realm of like, you totally lost your witness. You get up on stage and preach and you look like a total buffoon and everyone da 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 da. So anyone who is at that Alma game, I am sorry for the way I acted. But you know what? I could go into that ditch of like the condemnation 
Or I could go over into the other ditch of like, I don't have to repent for that. I was totally justified and I was totally right. And da, 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 da. Or then there's the good middle ground of going, okay, Lord, I repent for that. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that. But thank you, Lord, that you help me honor. That when I'm out and about, my light shines. Even amongst competition, my light shines. Okay. So, that's when I heard the stop the dishonor really loud. Stop the dishonor. So, in this house... Let's make it our goal and our mission to stop the dishonor. And you know what? For every person, it's going to look a little different. There's areas we all got to work on. But right now, the Holy Spirit is showing you when I said stop the dishonor, there's things that popped up. How many of you saw things that popped up? Stop the dishonor. Well, what is that? That's the Holy Spirit bringing it to you to say, hey, make that adjustment. Make that change. Are we treating God's house, his people, my serving, as no big deal? Because if I'm treating his people, or people in general, or God's house, as no big deal, how many of you know that's dishonor, and God can't honor dishonor? If I want more honor, then what do I have to do? Show more honor. If we want honor in this house to rise to another level, then what do I have to do? Not wait for someone to honor me. I honor regardless of whether someone honors or dishonors me. That should not be dependent like, well, I'm not going to honor you because you never honor me. That's not God's love. God's love is unconditional. He honored and he loved us before we ever chose him. That's the love of God. So, love and honor overlap each other. I can't love without honor, and I can't honor without love. They intertwine. So I'm going to go over a couple of our core values here. Are you all still with me? Took way longer on that story than I meant to. But I believe it helps us to have real life analogies. I know it helps me. Okay, so we uh, also shared this, but how many of you know this is, and this is one of our core values that we went over, but the Bible is our standard. Say that. Now say, the Bible is my standard. Pastor Nate just talked last week about it's important what I believe. It matters what I believe. Which means what? The word of God matters. And that may have been like, well, coming out of your mouth that the Bible is my standard. You're like, uh. We have to know. Like, we have to come to a place in our life where we say, ask yourself, is the Bible my standard? (laughs) Maybe that's the place we got to start. Is the Bible my standard? And then answer that. And then if I say, yes, the Bible is my standard, then what I have to do is I have to go, okay, what does the Bible say then? Because if the Bible is my standard and it's how I'm to live my life, then I have to obey it. So let's read this. The Bible is our standard. Culture changes, but God's word remains the same. Reading, believing, and acting upon God's word is our standard for living and how we experience spiritual growth. We position ourselves under the lordship of Jesus and his word. We choose to make the word of God final authority in our lives. So I love that. We position ourselves under the lordship of Jesus and his word. What does that mean? This is the standard. And we, we share this at team night. But if the word of God's the standard and it's here, and the world's culture, which how many of you know the world's culture is like getting lower and lower, right? It's like last year it could be here and now it's like, So say the world's culture is down here, but I'm right here. Am I holding the Bible as a standard? 
But you know what I can do? I can justify to myself that I'm okay because I'm not down here. I'm like above. I mean, I don't do this, this, and this. And I don't act like that, that, and that. But you know what? World culture is not where I get my standard from. That is not what I'm to compare my life to. And if I compare my life to the world standards, because here's the deal, the world standard does this constantly. Like we were just talking to my parents uh, when they were here last. And like certain things that were allowed when we were kids or not allowed, now is like, oh, it's just normal. Like what was looked at as like certain behaviors or certain talk or certain actions back when I was a kid that was looked at as like, oh my gosh, you don't say that or you don't do that. Now it's just like, oh, it's totally normal. It's okay. So if I'm, if I'm basing my standard and how I live my life and how I conduct myself on the world's standard, it's going to keep dropping. So because the world dishonors in all these areas, but it's okay for me to dishonor when I don't agree with something. Or what does the word say? Because as Christians, as children of the light, which we're called to be, when the world keeps getting lower, God's standard's still here. And it's going to look a lot higher. And we better be ready for some persecution, church. I'll say it again. We better be ready for some persecution. Now, maybe the persecution doesn't look like a gun to your head and you confess Jesus, but persecution looks like you don't watch that. Everybody watches that. You don't look at this. Everyone does that. You don't talk this way. Oh my gosh, you're not signing this petition to get our boss out of da 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 da. There's pressure all over. And we have to be ready. And we have to, like Pastor Nate said last week, know what we believe. You got to know what you believe. I'll say it again. You got to know what you believe. Because there's going to be persecution. There's going to be pressure from the enemy. There's going to be pressure from the world to get you to drop your standard. But if I know what my standard is, and my standard is the word of God, okay. I hold to the truth of the word. I don't let pressure, I don't let culture, I don't let other people pull me off of the standard of the word. So this is what we have to ask ourselves. Does my life reflect the standard of the word and am I holding it as truth or is there areas that I have not submitted to the lordship of Jesus in? Maybe because of persecution, maybe just because we've let go of some things. How many of you know it can just be easy to let go of some things? Which is why the word's so important, because it is our standard. It says this in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what the word of God does for us. It thoroughly equips us for every good work. But you know what I have to do? I have to receive it. Even some of the scriptures I look at and my flesh doesn't like sometimes. I have to receive it. Like my flesh not wanting to repent for screaming. But you know what I had to do? I had to come under that word that he was saying, hey, you didn't honor. And you know what I had to do? I had to humble myself under it and say, you know what? You're right, Lord. That wasn't right. And I repent for that. Well, you know what? Then there's more grace to do what he's asked me to do. Aren't you thankful for that? In repentance comes more grace. Thank you, Lord, for more grace to honor. Let's just say that. Thank you, Lord, for more grace to honor. And due to time, we won't get through all this, but... Um, I did want to highlight just a couple things. So in honoring, who do we owe honor to? 
And the word tells us here. Let's look at um, 1 Peter 2, 17 through 18 in the Amplified. It says this, Show respect for all men. Treat them honorably. Love the brotherhood, the Christian fraternity of which Christ is the head. Reverence God. Honor the emperor. You who are household servants, be submissive to your masters with all proper respect, not only to those who are kind and considerate and reasonable, but also to those who are surly, overbearing, unjust, and crooked. So what do we see, what do we see here from Scripture where we're to give honor? We're to value and honor other people. What does it say? Show respect for what? All men. That right there, it could just be said that. Show honor and respect for all men. You know what it doesn't say? Show honor and respect for all men when you agree with them. Show honor and respect for all men when you like them. How many of you know our culture has gotten over into, if I disagree with someone, not only do I disagree, but with the disagreement comes dishonor. Not so. That's not how the culture of the kingdom works. God does give us choice, but just because I disagree with Mona doesn't mean I have to dishonor her. Do you know you can disagree with someone without dishonoring them? Without slandering the person? Without treating them and belittling them? So what does it say? Show respect, show honor to all men. That means the person to the right and to the left of you. That means the mayor of this city. That means the president. That means the president you voted for or didn't vote for. That means governing officials. That means your boss. That means your coaches. That means your teachers. That means your coworkers. Want me to throw in anything else? Referees. <laughs> that was quick-witted. <laughs> Referees. All men. Show honor toward all men. And then I love that it says this. Love for the brotherhood. You know that it actually says even more so in the household of faith? Mona just hit on it on Wednesday night and that scripture just stood out to me. What am I doing to bless people in this house? When was the last time you blessed someone, not a coworker, not a family member, but when was the last time you blessed someone in your local house of Beyond Church, your brother and sister in Christ in the local house God's called you to? When's the last time you blessed someone? Maybe it was a long time ago. Maybe the last thing we did was not bless someone. Maybe we used our words to sit, tear someone down and to not build somebody up, but I wanna challenge you all the more inside the household of faith. Let's step out. I actually sent myself an email on Wednesday night because I think it'd be awesome to do a challenge to say, not really a challenge, but just a blessing something. I don't know what you call it, but just to say, I like a, a thing to say, I, I'm gonna bless Jenna. Lord, who do you want me to bless? Like, what if we just went around in here all the more? We're to bless out there and we're to bless people, but it says even more so in our household of faith. So I want to challenge everyone in here. That can be your homework. Bless somebody. It may be one, it may be five, it may be a text, it may be a gift, it may be a note, it may be a hug, it may be a high five. I don't, whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do, but bless somebody. Let my words be used to what? Bring honor to somebody else. Let my tongue be used to what? Honor and bless and call the gifts out in somebody. Man, the world is so full of negativity, just harping on people, fault finding, doing anything we can to slander and to whatever. And if we're not careful, church, that culture gets into us which isn't really a culture, it's actually a spirit. It's a divisive strife spirit. So in this house, let's say we honor, and I go out of my way to honor somebody. What does out of my way mean? It's not convenient. 
What does serving God, what does serving others mean? It's not convenient. So my son um, likes to wear shoes without socks, my youngest. And he came home the other night and we could not figure out what this smell was in our house. And (laughs) we were trying to figure it out. We thought it was the trash. So we took out the trash and it's like still horrible. And actually Jay was over too. And he's like, it stinks so bad. And I'm like, I know, I, I don't know what it is. And then Kale goes, oh, it's my feet after like 10 or 15 minutes and we're like oh my gosh so he likes to wear his shoes without socks more so just because he doesn't want to take the time to put on the socks so I was like you have to wear socks because you're it stinks and um he went to the shower I was like you need to go scrub your feet well when he came out they were still like bad and I was like did you even scrub them and then the next day he was like mom they still stink and I've taken like two or three showers and I was like get over here I'm gonna wash your feet So he came over to the kitchen sink and I washed his feet. Um, (laughs) They stunk. But you know what? I had a picture of Jesus at that moment. And I began to talk to him about how Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And he said, wash their feet? Why would he do that? And I said, it was actually in that culture and in that day a form of honor. And what he was saying is he came to serve. Was it convenient to wash my son's feet? No. Did it stink? Yeah. Was it gross? Yeah. But you know what I was doing? At that moment, I was serving him. Serving looks stinky sometimes. Meaning some of the stuff you do to serve isn't what you would choose to do. But it wouldn't be called serving. What Jesus came to do didn't look perfect. When he honored us, it it wasn't just like, oh, there's just so easy to honor. He, he had to make a choice. He, it cost him something. Our honor should cost us something. Our service to God, our service inside the house, our service outside of the house should cost us something. We live in such a culture where we just, it doesn't have to cost, If well, I'll do it if it doesn't cost me anything. I'll do it if it doesn't take my time. I'll do it if I don't have to get there early. I'll do it if I don't have to stay late. On my job, I'll do it, you know, if I get paid. I mean, where's the pay? Don't I get paid? This mentality has to go. We have to be filled with honor. We have to be filled with service. Service to God means it's not going to be convenient for me. It means it's not always going to be what I want and what I choose because otherwise it wouldn't be called serving. I had this note. Let me see if I have it in here. Um, It was something that, um, sorry, give me just a minute because I really wanted to. I think it's under here. Sorry, hang on one second. Okay, so if I remember who I'm serving first, that's key. You know, you may squeak one by your boss, but guess who sees it? You know that phrase, oh, don't worry, no one's watching. Someone's always watching. And I preach this to our boys too, but your character is what you do when no one's watching. Your character speaks when no one's watching. So when your boss isn't standing over you, how do you act and behave? When your parents aren't around, how do you talk? How do you behave? When your spouse isn't around, what do you do? What do you say? What is this? This is all honor for God, honor for others. And remembering who I'm serving first. I'm serving God. And my honor for Him should outweigh myself. And this is what... um, I think Brother Keith said this. He said, take care of that business, but you could say anything. As if Jesus personally owned the organization himself. So in your house, in this church, I, we talk to our staff and to our kids about this. If I see a piece of trash at church, do I just walk by? 
because it's inconvenient for me to bend down and pick it up and go walk it all the way over to the trash can? Or do I pick up the piece of trash and throw it away because I'm treating it as God owns this organization? God owns this business. At your workplace, are you just doing barely enough to get by? Are, are you not giving your all because, pff, well, I don't even like my boss and I don't even like this business and how they treat people and da, 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 da. But what are you doing to honor? What are you doing to extend honor? What are you doing to serve your boss? What are you doing to serve your coworkers? Oftentimes that critical spirit gets in and we find and nitpick everything about everybody else and look at everything everyone else is doing or not doing. And really the problem is us. What did we talk about at the beginning? I'm not thinking of other people in this message. I'm looking at me. Lord, where do I need to make the adjustments? Where do I need to make the correction to honor? If it's in my ability to honor, if it's in my ability to love, if it's in my ability to serve, then let me do it. That should be our motto. Let's stand up and we're going to pray. And then we're going to take a little bit of time here. And um, I saw this, um, we have the worship team up here because I really want, um, you know, oftentimes it can be so easy to come into church, hear a message and walk out of the doors and go, oh, that's great. And maybe even things that the Holy Spirit speaks to us that we take and go, yeah, I need to apply that. But then we leave and we have lunch and we have kids and we have schedules and we have appointments to be at and we have things to do and we have jobs and we have to prepare for the week and we have, and then you know what gets shoved to the side? The very most important thing, God's word to us. And so today I wanted to take time to actually, um, and you know, we do this altar time at the end because not only does it give God opportunity to move and to do things for healing and salvation and all of those things, but also the altar was a form of sacrifice. And I think we've lost that in a sense, a lot of um, in, in church services and in times where we can take a moment to pause and to reflect on what God is saying and then make those adjustments. What is a sacrifice? They would bring that sacrifice to the altar. And then you know what? They would put it on the altar and then they would burn it. And today, that's what I saw, that we would put some things on the altar and allow God to remove it, burn it up. Well, what is it? Any form of dishonor. So it may be with a person. It may be an attitude that I need to do. It may be turning this off or adjusting. I don't know what it is for you, but whatever the Holy Spirit ministers to you, but I want us to make, I want everyone in this room and everyone's actions gonna look a little different. It may be sitting down and writing it in your journal. It may be coming up to the altar before the Lord. It may be sitting in your chair and just worshiping him and bringing those things before him. But I don't want any person in this room to not take a step of action. Why? Because action means I have faith in God. Do you know faith isn't just believing? Faith is believing and responding. There is a response, church, that we have to do. And you know what? In the American culture, it's just so easy to just hear it and not ever respond and not ever step out and not ever. Why? Because we just want to be comfortable. Don't make me step out. Don't make me do something. What what are people going to think? You know what? We have to get over that and we have to say, Lord, who am I honoring? I, I'm not here for you. I'm not here for the approval of man. We have to get over the fear of man. This is something we teach our kids. Oh, don't be afraid. Don't care what the kids at school think of you. But how much of us as adults operate under the fear of man and caring what people are going to think? I mean, I just spilled my beans in front of y'all. Like, We have to get past the point of caring what people think and being real and being authentic because that's what God cares about. He cares about your heart. You're not fooling him. Some of you need to hear that. Your non-action and your non-response to him, you're not fooling him. 
He sees your heart. Every person in this room, he sees your heart. And you know what? You can do all the churchy things. You can walk in the door. You can serve. You can open your Bible. You can take notes. You can lift your hands and worship. And all of it can just be actions. And you can fool everyone in this room. But you know the one person you cannot fool? Your maker. Your creator. Your God. He sees you. And this isn't to be hard. This is to be like a call up to say, Lord, I'm going to honor you. I don't care what people think. I've spit a lot today. I don't care what people think. I'm going to honor you with my heart. My heart is in it. People act like fools at ball games, cheering and doing all sorts of stuff. And they don't care. They don't care. Why is it when we get into God's house, we let loose? Do what's in your heart. Be free to do what's in your heart. Not just inside these walls, outside of these walls. What he tells you to do, be free to do it. And I just see that today. Lord, I just thank you. Freedom in this house today. Just free from the fear of man. Free from what people think. And just free to step out. Free to be bold. Things that have held us. Lord, we thank you for that boldness to speak that boldness to act, that boldness to do all that you've called us to do. Let us be bold. Let us act from our heart. Let us, what we do, be an honor to you as a response to you. So just keep your eyes closed. And I want us to make that change today. Make that change of saying, Lord, I'm switching from dishonoring talk. I'm switching from dishonoring thoughts. I'm, I'm making that change. I'm stopping the dishonor. For a lot of us, you know what? It's not even having to say or do something. For a lot of us, it's just stopping. Stop talking. In a sense of stop talking dishonor. Stop thinking the thoughts of dishonor. It's just stopping it, stopping that dishonor. And you know what I saw? When we step over from dishonor into honor, into his grace, into that anointing, you know what we actually do? We go higher. You know today you can leave higher than how you came. Everyone close your eyes. If we can dim the lights, please. And... um today's teaching and really what I saw is that it's going to require some changes. You know, anytime the word of God is taught and it's presented, it always gives a choice. You know, I'm not coming down to each one of you, nor is God and saying, you've got to change. You got to do it. You got to love me. You got to honor. Honor is not a thing of like, you got to do it. Just honor me. You got to honor me. I don't go to our staff or, or to my husband and be like, you need to honor me. You just need to honor me. Don't you just know that's so disrespectful? You need to honor. I can't demand honor. I can show honor. It's not up to me to control my spouse. It's not up to me to control other people, but it is up to me as to what I'm gonna do. And as for me, I can show honor. I can show love. And so today I just saw that, that we use this altar as a time to make a change. The word was presented. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking. I believe he's showing areas. And you know what? It's our job to respond to that. And like I said earlier, to take an action. And so I want, no one's paying attention to anyone. This is between you and the Lord, but it it does. Faith does require action. And so I want you, whatever that is, writing it down, coming to the Lord, before the Lord, whatever it might be. We're just going to take a couple minutes here and I want us to get before the Lord and say, Lord, show me. Show me those areas that I need to adjust. Show me those things that I need to change. Show me those ways that I've been dishonoring. You know, 1 Samuel 2.30, we didn't get there today, but it says, those who honor me, I will honor. And those who lightly esteem me, I will lightly esteem. And you know, some of you in this room today, You've been dealing with stuff and and you've been frustrated 
And I really felt like when I was studying, I heard the Lord say, there's areas of dishonor that's keeping you from his honor. There's areas of dishonor in your life that's keeping you from his honor. What does that mean? His heart, his desire is to honor. His his desire is to bless us. But you know what? When we step out from under his authority and we go into I'm doing it myself or my way of doing things, we pull ourselves out from that blessing and that honor. And so what can it be? It can just be a simple step. Some of you may be even dealing with health issues. And you know what? It's tied to your mouth. It's tied to the dishonor coming out of your mouth. And when you change that, when you step back over into love, when you step back over into blessing, when you step back over into honor, you'll watch that health will flow into your body. So I want us to take just a couple minutes here. You can come to the altar. You can do whatever you need to. But I want us to just get quiet before the Lord, okay? We'll take just a couple minutes.